Welcome to AMBO TV. Each week we bring you dynamic sermons from next generation pastors from across the country. And as always, they're bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. And then we'll discuss those sermons right here in studio. I'm Dean, so awkward it's funny, Windsor. And we have some great sermons for you today from Georgia and New York. Fun facts, Georgia is known as the birthplace of civil rights. And in the early 19th century, New York City sanitation was just a bunch of pigs roaming around Manhattan eating the garbage. I mean, crazy, right? Uh, I feel like I just threw my city under the bus, but these are facts. Don't believe me? Google it, y'all. And uh, let's go ahead and get into it. First up, we have Pastor Gerald Fadeyomi, I really hope I'm saying that right, bro, from Mountain Lake Church in Forsyth, Georgia. And he's still in their sermon, Life, My Response. This message is called More in Store. And he's asking, what do you do when God disrupts your plans? And next, we're going to go to Northridge Church with Pastor Aaron Hickson in Rochester, New York. And his sermon is called Kids These Days from their sermon series, Uncommon. And he's giving some helpful tools with raising well-rounded and God-centered children. I like that. And lastly, we head back to Georgia to Hope Church in Warner Robins with Pastor Jordan Poole, my man. And he's in a sermon series on prayer. And this message is called when the church prays, and he wants to encourage us to have the boldness to pray those hard prayers like prayers of healing and prayers of freedom. Uh, I'll also be joined in studio with Pastor Alex Williams from IIM in Brooklyn. That's right, Brooklyn's in the house, y'all. And he's here to help me break down these sermons today. We're going to get back to Pastor Alex, but right now, let's go to Mountain Lake Church with Pastor Gerald. And so the question this morning is this, is what do you do when Jesus interrupts your plans? What do you do when Jesus interrupts your plans? I'll give you some examples. You have a picture for your relationships? Maybe a relationship with a parent, maybe a relationship with a family member. And maybe the picture that you had in mind was that there's some tension in that relationship, there's been some drama, maybe there was a fight. Maybe at 18 you decided, I'm never talking to them again, I'm going to do it my own way, and there's been distance in the relationship, and your picture is that it would stay that way. But what do you do when Jesus steps in and he goes, hey, I need you to forgive them? What do you do in those moments? You have a picture for your career. Maybe it's that you would climb the ladder and eventually you'd get to the seat and you'd become the boss and everyone would be looking to you because you got the promotion and you put in the hard work. But along the way, they're starting to ask you to do some things that morally you're not sure that you should necessarily do because Jesus is calling you to a different standard. What do you do when he steps into the picture that you have for your work life? You have a picture for your kids and for their future for the people that they'll be, for the type of person that they'll marry, maybe for what their career will be. But what do you do when your kid comes to you and says, hey, I feel like God is moving me in a different direction, and they pick a career that you don't necessarily agree with, or that isn't going to make them a lot of money, and it feels like your investment is going out of the window. What do you do when Jesus interrupts that plan? You have a picture for your friendships, for the people that you'll hang out with, for the people who will be in your small group. Well, what do you do when there's this person that keeps showing up over and over and over again in your picture and they drive you absolutely crazy? And you walk out of the bathroom and you're like, I hope she's not there. And you turn and she is right in your face. <laughs> you're like, I cannot get away from her. What do you do when Jesus is calling you to be friends with someone you don't want to be friends with? When he interrupts your picture. You have a picture for your faith. And maybe for some of you, if you were to be completely honest, the picture that you have for your relationship with God is that you would show up at church on Sunday and you would check the box and then you would go live your life the way you want Monday through Saturday. But what do you do when Jesus steps into the middle of that picture and he goes, no, 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 it's a relationship. I want to know you every day of the week. What do you do in those moments? What do we do when Jesus interrupts our plans? To answer that question, I want to take a look at a passage of scripture. It's one of my favorite um, section of scriptures in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 5. It's the moment that Peter first decides to follow Jesus. And what I love so much about this particular book is that Luke um, wasn't a, a disciple. He didn't walk with Jesus. He didn't talk with Jesus. He was a physician who, after the fact, came back around and said, I need to know who he is. I've heard the rumors, so I have to write an orderly account and figure out this whole story of this Jesus. And so he interviewed eyewitnesses, and he uh, examined all of the evidence, and he put together this orderly account of the life of Jesus. This is not just a story in the Bible. These aren't just words on the pages. This is evidence of who Jesus actually was and the life that he actually lived. And in Luke chapter 5, we see the moment that Peter decided to follow Jesus. I'll read it to you, and then we'll pull a few things out of it. It says this. It says, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, 
the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, that, uh, the one belonging to Simon or Peter, and asked him to put out a little bit from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, put out into the deep waters and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, Jesus, I'll let down my nets. When they had done so, such a large number of fish, uh, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. When Jesus, then Jesus said to Simon, Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore, left everything, and they followed him. There's three things that I think Peter began to understand in this interaction with Jesus that if we would begin to understand, I think would help us appropriately respond when Jesus interrupts our plans. So I want to take you back through the story and point out these three things. Jesus is teaching, and this crowd of people is there to hear him teach. Everywhere that Jesus went, there would be a crowd because his popularity had grown. They wanted to see what miracles he was going to do, what lesson he was going to teach. And so this crowd of people is there to hear Jesus the problem, though, was that Jesus didn't have a microphone in his day, and so he had to find a way to amplify his voice so that the crowd would be able to hear what it is that he had to say. And so he looks around, and he sees, okay, there's these, these boats. So he steps into the boat that happened to belong to Peter, and he knows that from the boat he can amplify his voice off of the water so the crowd can hear. So he says, hey, Peter, would you mind pushing off a little bit from the shore? And Peter obliges and rows out just a little bit. Jesus sits down and he begins to preach this message to the crowd. But once he's done, he turns his attention to Peter. This is the first thing that, that I want us to see in this interaction between Peter and Jesus, is that while there is a crowd of people that Jesus speaks to, he never misses out on a conversation with an individual. Welcome back. And joining me in studio today is Pastor Alex. Pastor, thank you so much for being here today. What's up, man? Oh, man. Good All to right. see you. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. It's great to meet you. Um, so I want to jump right into this. And, okay. And, you know, part of the thing that, that he was talking about is this path that, that God sets out for us. So um, I thought I was going to be the next host of TRL. You know, I, I didn't. God pushed me here. Now I'm the host of Ambo. I, I could have fought it, but I didn't. I went with it. So you know, what would you tell a friend or, or a member of your church that you see is like fighting that path that God has set for them? Let me tell you, I, this conversation happens with every millennial in our church, okay. like literally. Right. Um, the scripture in Jeremiah says, for I know the plans that I have towards you, the plans of good and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. And I think that once we kind of know who God is and know how amazing he is and how brilliant he is, he knows every gift that he's placed inside of you. He knows all the talents. He, he knows everything before you get there. Okay. So literally, um, the, the, what I tell the people is like, God knows your life. He knows the roadblocks. He knows what he has for you. He knows things that you cannot see. So when you learn to trust in him, literally you're submitting yourself to his, to his will and it's difficult, but he knows better than you, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it can also be a thing too, because I found that when I fight, sometimes I, I fight the direction or I fight, things just tend to go horribly wrong in life. <laughs> and you think that's almost like a warning sign from God? Like, look, dude, you got to switch it up. I'm trying to tell you which way. Right. Can the warning signs be harsh or, or, or are they no, subtle? The, the warning signs are all... all Always harsh. It's it's crazy. Um, story in the Bible about Jonah. He he was literally given an assignment from God to go speak and give a word and bring deliverance to a group of people. Okay. And he because of his disobedience, uh, it took him to places that he had not planned to go and that he did not want to go. Yeah. But at the same time, our yes to God can either be willing or yeah. come with a price. It, right. it, the time uh, the, that it takes you to get away uh, and you have to find yourself and all that stuff just to say yes to God. So just put up your hands of surrender and say yes, Lord. All right. <laughs> you heard it from Pastor Alex. Put up your hands, surrender, say yes to the Lord. And right now we're going to say yes to taking a short break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing you next generation pastors 
from across the country. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Gerald, but right now, I want to head to Pastor Aaron. Let's go check him out. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. So discipline, like the restraint that comes from being corrected, someone interfering in your life and saying like, oh, look, you're out of bounds. Come back into the, the, the boundaries. That brings knowledge. And, and then it continues. But whoever hates correction is stupid. <laughs> I, I don't like being called stupid, especially by the Bible. But this verse calls me stupid because I tend to think that freedom comes when there are no rules. But the trend that we see throughout the book of Proverbs specifically is that freedom is actually found in careful adherence to the right set of rules. So generically speaking, a person plus restraints is what results in freedom in our everyday life. It doesn't matter the person, the age, the background, any person plus restraint is freedom. So what in the world does this have to do with parenting? Here we go. Let's connect it together, okay? So if we're thinking of any person plus restraint meaning freedom, then let's put a child in this, in this box here. What would a child need to result in freedom? If any person plus restraint, well, child, what, what would restraint look like in the life of a child? Well, we, we, we think of it, and this comes through parents, what it results in is a child plus discipline equals freedom. Now, don't get caught up on that word. We're going we're gonna to define it here in a minute. But if a person plus restraint in the life of a child, that looks like discipline to result in freedom. Restraints, limitations on children's behavior is something I think we all recognize is important. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about discipline just as consequences for bad behavior. I mean, I do mean that. But I mean it in a broader sense, the applying of any kind of structure onto life and behavior with children. So this could be, discipline could look as simple as like a feeding schedule for an infant or a napping schedule for a toddler or a bedtime routine for an elementary school kid or like a minimum required GPA for a high school student. Anything that imposes structure. Parents are the ones who are intended to provide this for their children, the necessary restrictions to produce freedom. And what we said earlier is that we also know that parenting matters, and now we're discovering why that is. The Bible seems to think that parenting matters because discipline matters. Parenting matters because discipline matters. And this might seem like common sense, but I would say it's only common sense because it was once uncommon sense, and the Bible has had influence on the way that we think and how our culture operates. There is, let me tell you, no shortage of verses in the book of Proverbs about parents and the importance of discipline. No shortage. I will give you a very small sampling of the amount of material that there is, and there's plenty more we could explore. Proverbs 29, 17 says this, discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. At the moment, with the age of our kids, it doesn't always feel like they are pouring on delights <laughs> in our life. But it sounds like key, discipline might be the key to having that happen someday. Uh, Proverbs 23, 13 says, Do not withhold discipline from your child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. By the way, we'll come back to the rod thing. If you just need to replace that with discipline in your head, I get it. It sounds kind of crazy, but let's keep going. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Okay, look at the strength of that language. Discipline is a life or death issue with our kids. This is not just the difference between like a well-adjusted 30-year-old. We're talking about life and death here. Continues on, Proverbs 22, verse 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. The default setting on a kid is toward misbehaving. All right, there's Pastor Aaron. Now, yeah, I want to ask you a question really quickly about parenting. So, so... I think we all want to be a little lenient uh, on our kids nowadays, but, but do you think that maybe this leniency is kind of leading towards this mass disrespect that we're, that we're starting to see in kids <laughs> lately? I, that's just not my story. It's not my narrative at all. Okay. My parents were really strict. Right. Um, I, old school, like Southern old school, like okay. really strict. Uh, but didn't even realize that the fact that they were so strict showed me that they cared because they gave me attention. They didn't just allow me to do whatever I wanted to do. They, were re they really honed in and they were active in, when it came down to schoolwork and they would show up to my school. But it at least showed me as I got older that my parents cared enough to be there. Okay. And if they weren't there and they just let me do my own thing, 
I'm, I'm trying to find myself in the age that I need to be reared and structured, you know? Yeah, because it's scary. I mean, you can't let a kid try to find themselves, especially not now. Not at that age, they, yeah. no, not at all. And not now with social media. I mean, trying to let a kid, that's now everybody else is going to tell your kid how to be. Which right. Is, yeah, that's a scary thought. Now, right. I remember being on a city bus and uh, spitting out a piece of gum. My mom just coming across, Mom, I love you. But Mom came across <laughs> my face so hard. I never spit out another piece of gum again. I still to this day take out a piece of paper and I'll spit it in there. Right. Wrap it up and that's it. So discipline, while you know we, we are a little apprehensive, it's still a good thing, right? I mean, the Bible does say spoil the rod, you know, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. Yeah. And I'm not advocating at all for yeah. <laughs> like pounding on your kids. All right. All right. That's it. See, we're not advocating for it. No, not it at all. Thing. All right. So we're going to get back to Pastor Aaron. But right now, I want to go ahead and get to Pastor Jordan Poole and see what he's talking about today. Let's go check him out. Our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he, what he's teaching them, he says, you need to first understand who you're approaching. You need to understand that he oversees all, and he sees every detail, the good, bad, and ugly. He knows every part of you inside and out. He knows every thought you think before you even think it. That's how brilliant our God is. He, he is our Father who art in heaven. He is above all, sees all, and rules over all. So he's teaching them how to pray. And so, so we, 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 we get to the point where, where we have to understand that I'm not approaching a man. I'm not, I'm not approaching a man. I'm approaching a God who has an abundant supply. I'm approaching a God who, who, who literally calls each star by name. I, that, just, that, that blows my mind. It baffles me to even think that the God who knows every star's name knows every hair that I have on my head. And he pays attention to the details of my life. Some of you, that'll set you free if you just understand that God actually cares about your life. He care, I, don't know, I don't care what religious, uh, dogmatic, traditionalist system told you that God was mad at you. He was angry at you. And you got to look like he's angry at you all the time. And you got to look mad all the time to be holy. I'm sorry, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. And so I, I, I know that he's, he is in charge of my life. I think some people think the more hope they think the, the, the meaner you look, the more holy you are. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter seven, uh, in my Bible, I don't know about your Bible, in Second Chronicles chapter seven, the title of Second Chronicles chapter seven is Solomon dedicates the temple. Solomon dedicates the temple, and he's dedicating the temple. In the Old Testament, they would sacrifice a lot of animals and a lot of bulls, a lot of sheep to, 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 to honor God and to atone for sin. And so Solomon is doing, he's, he's, he's sacrificed northwards of like 100,000 sheep to honor God because they want God's presence. They want God to come and, and reside in a place. And so, so he's doing this. And then we get to verse 14, and God responds to Solomon dedicating the temple and committing the temple. And so, so God responds in verse 14 in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. I will come, forgive their sin, and heal their land. How many know our nation needs some healing? But isn't it amazing that as Solomon has dedicated and committed the temple, that God comes and speaks to him on the issue of prayer? That he comes and speaks to him on the matter of the importance of prayer and what happens in the transaction and in the approach of your prayers to me. And of course, I'm talking about the temple in the Old Testament, but what I'm really talking about is what the Bible says in the New Testament, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Come on, does anybody believe that still? That I am a carrier, I am a DNA bloodline carrier of the same spirit that caused a stone to move out of the way many thousands of years ago so my Savior, Jesus, could come out of the tomb and give me resurrection life. I am a carrier of that same spirit. And so when, it, when God says, if my people, I'm already good because I know who my, whose label is on me. I know whose identity I walk in. I walk in the image of Christ. I'm made in the image of God. I am made in his image. So his label is on me. Some of you need to take the labels, the labels of family members that have tried to put on you and the labels of what society has tried to place on you and what your situation is trying to label you as, as a failure. No, you are God's people and you're called by his name and you are made in his image. 
God says that my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. See, I can tell when, when someone ain't been praying, they get prideful. Because prayer has a way of talking. When you talk to God, you can't come to God prideful. He's going to get that out of you. But people who understand humility, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You ain't got to worry about your own promotion. God's going to do it for you. God is the best marketing campaign you could ever ask for. There's Pastor Jordan Poole, always with the energy. We love his preaching style here at Ambo. So, um... Pastor Alex, he's talking about these labels that, that we love. You know, we, we love these labels. We love, you know, MBA and, you know, MD and, and all these things that we strive for. And we're so proud of these labels. But it seems we're not as proud as the label that's the most important, which is the God label. So how do we kind of put more importance on the God label than an MBA? I mean, it, I think it's, it's kind of hard because we're, we're working with it in our church with a lot of people who are in the industry. Okay. And it's like it's kind of corny to, to preach God and, and, and to be a believer. But once you understand like who you are and who you belong to, I think that it shines out greater. Um, we, we've decided in our church to brand our own stuff. Watch God work. And, and we wanted to make sure that it was appealing. But at the same time, the message was relevant. But at the same time, it spoke to who we are. Okay. And so I think that um, once you live the life, then it won't be a compromise uh, yeah. to what you wear. And, and, and you can brand God and say, hey, I'm, I'm a king's kid. Okay. You know? All right. I love it. Yeah. And I mean, now, now you say the industry. So, you know, there's been some really good strives, too, with, within the entertainment industry with right. people like uh, Kirk Franklin. And, and then you have Taraji Henson. And then you have, you know, Tyler Perry. Everybody's proclaim, pro proclaiming. I got tongue tied today. Their, <laughs> their love for God, which is great. And it's motivational for all of us. Um, we're going to get back to Pastor Alex, and we'll get back to Pastor Jordan Poole, but right now, we got some bills to pay, man. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing a fresh New style to the Word of God. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Jordan Poole, but right now, I'm going to go ahead and get back to Pastor Gerald and let him wrap up his sermon. Let's check him out. I have more in store, Peter, than what you have in mind. I have bigger plans for you, bigger dreams for you, bigger hopes for you. Peter, I know you're a fisherman and you're great at it, but you are going to be a fisher of men. I have influence for you and opportunity for you that you could never even imagine. You see, God had more in store than what Peter had in mind, and the same is true for us. That's the third thing, that God has more in store than what you have in mind. That regardless of what your picture is, how good or bad it is, that God has more in store for you than anything you could have imagined for yourself. And I imagine what's happening for Peter in this moment as he comes to these three realizations that God sees him individually, uh, that God is bigger than he thought, and that God had more in store than what he had in mind. I imagine what was happening in his heart is that he was holding his plans like this. I'll be a fisherman. I'll live in my city. I'll feed my wife. Everything is going to be great, and I'll just stay right here. Everything will be okay. But then Jesus shows up, and he goes, oh, he sees me. Oh, oh, oh he's, he's bigger than, than I am. Oh, he has plans for me. And Peter began to open his hands. He began to trust God with his plans. And so according to Luke's account, he gets out of the boat. He leaves everything behind. And he proceeds to follow Jesus. I love this. It reminds me of what the psalmist said in, in Psalm 9 10. He says this. He says, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. What is the psalmist saying? He's saying, hey, those who know you live lives that look like this because they trust you. And they know that whatever they could have planned for themselves could be good, but what you have for them is far bigger, it's far better than anything that they could ever imagine on their own. So those who know you, those who really know you, know that you're not going to leave them or forsake them. And so they walk through life with their hands wide open to the plans that you might have for them, and they walk wherever you would have them to go. Now, I want to be really clear about what was on the table for Peter and what was on the table and what's on the table for us this morning. More is not a mistake-free life. Peter made a lot of mistakes. In fact, Peter made arguably the biggest mistake in the New Testament. Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never turn my back on you. I'll literally die for you. And then he betrays him three times in a row. Massive mistake. 
More is not a problem-free life. Peter had some problems that came his way. In fact, he was crucified upside down, excruciating death. It's not problem-free. More is not a wealth-guaranteed life. Hey, if you follow Jesus, everything's going to go great. You'll get whatever you want, and you'll just be as rich as you could ever imagine. This is not a prosperity gospel. That's not what following Jesus is. That's not more. No, no, more is a purpose in life. It's waking up every morning knowing that you're a part of something that's bigger than you. More is more meaning in life. It's the small things becoming big things because Jesus is in the picture. More is a richness to life that money can't buy. That was on the table for Peter. And when Peter realized that, he'd started to let go of his plans and open his hands and trust God and move in the direction of Jesus. And when he did, he experienced more. It's crazy to me, 2,000 years later, we're in a church in Forsyth County and we're talking about a fisherman. 2,000 years later, we're sitting in this room and there are people in this room who were named after a fisherman from 2,000 years ago. It doesn't make any sense. But it's what happened when Peter lived his life like this. You know what's crazy to me? It's not just Peter's story that this really is just the story of what happens when Jesus interrupts your plan and you respond in the right way. All right, there was Pastor Gerald. And, uh, you know, I really like what he's touching on here because I see this a lot. Mm -hmm. And people kind of get blessings mixed up with material stuff all the time. So, you know, and this, this isn't really the gospel of prosperity, right? As right. my producer, Brooke, is reminding me. <laughs> um, you know, so what do we say to people that are like, I'm praying, but I'm not getting the things that I wanted. Like, how do we really explain to them, like, bro, that's, this isn't how it works? Bro, I love the like, response. Bro. Bro. You're not kidding. <laughs> uh, the Bible says in Matthew 6 and 33, right? Jesus said it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. right, first, and his righteousness. And he assures that all these other things shall be added. And I think that when you put his kingdom second and you put other things first, then you don't receive what, you're, what is intended to come to you. But God gives us strict instructions and say that when you seek me first, when you seek the kingdom first, church growth occurs. Uh, finances will occur. Uh, where you're supposed to be from a, from a sense of uh, opportunity will come. But God doesn't bless opportunities. He blesses those who prioritize him. Mm, exactly. See, and this is what I'm saying. And, and, and people don't get it. So that want for... I'm, I'm, you know, everybody wants a mansion. I want a mansion. Right. I want a yacht. I want, you know, a MTV pet. cribs. MTV cribs. <laughs> I want a pet tiger. You know, yeah. like that's these are your wants beforehand, and and right. obviously, you know, going back to what you said, you're you're putting those wants before God, and God obviously yeah. comes first. So, but at the same time, we shouldn't be thinking like there's some kind of reward system, even though there is. Our our rewards are more right. spiritual, though. Right. Correct. I mean, we grew up in a system where if you did good in a test, yeah. uh, you get a sticker. So we're already prone to and, 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 and to think that way. Yeah. But really, it is a heart check. What does my heart want? Uh, I, am I, what am I doing this for? Am I doing this just for the rewards or to please God? Mm -hmm. And I think that while man looks on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. And so he knows whether your heart is in the condition to receive what you need from God. And if, you, if your motives are jacked up, if they're all over the place. All right, see? Pastor Alex with the words of wisdom. That was Pastor Gerald, but right now, I want to get back to Pastor Jordan Poole and let him finish up his sermon. Let's go ahead. Prayer will grow your faith. Prayer will make you more boldly. That's why it says approach his throne boldly. Because you get boldness. You get boldness. It's so funny because, you know, if you're in a hope group, maybe you've experienced this before. And you, maybe you've, you've encountered this. But when it comes time, to, and you're around Christians, right? And somebody be like, hey, can you pray for us? Like deer in the headlights. It's like, my goodness. I didn't ask you to preach. I asked you to just pray, pray for us. Oh, no, I'm not today. Not today. And it, it, it is comical. But at the same time, when we have this, this fear and this anxiety, because some of us naturally, we, we just have a fear of talking in front of people. But at the same time, quick show of hands, quick poll, so I need you to respond. Quick poll, show of hands. How many of you believe the name of Jesus actually has power in it when you say it? Okay. So, so, if, I'm, if, if we're too 
nervous or anxious, and I get it, is you don't like talking, but, 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 but you're, you're, you're talking to God. But at the same time, if I'm too afraid to, to pray in front of people who believe what I believe, what's going to happen when the friend or the neighbor bumps into you at the grocery store? And says, I'm going through it. I need you. I know, I know you believe in God. I know you believe. And watch it. It'll happen. Because people who aren't saved, people who don't live for Jesus, will come to you because they know you do and say, hey, I need you to pray for me. <laughs> and I, here's, what, here's what I'm believing. Here's what I'm, I'm, I'm believing and challenging you that you're not, you won't say when that moment comes. You won't say, I, 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 I'll definitely pray for you and just keep on going. No, I, I believe and challenge right now that when that moment happens, you will stop and say, give me your hands. We're about to pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare freedom. I declare healing. I speak over my brother or my sister right now that your presence is moving. In the, I don't care. See, see, see I, I still believe in, in, the, in the, 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 the touch and agree. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That might be old school. I don't care, but I still believe in a touch and an agree because I still believe in the transference of power. That's why there's power in the laying on of hands because I still believe what's on me can get on you because God is not a, a respecter of persons. And, but if he's anointed me to, to minister to you and to pray for you, the moment I touch you, I believe there's a transference of what I got hitting your life. That's why you do need to be more in tune and be more inclined to hear when the Holy Spirit says pray for that person right now and when you obey watch what will happen it will be like the room stops moving it will be like the whole world stops spinning and everybody's like what are they doing over there what's going on hey what are y'all praying let me, let me get some of that and then all of a sudden before you know it up in Geico up in Starbucks up in Walmart up in Kroger you got a prayer meeting happening on aisle 6 why because somebody understands the power of prayer Yes, Pastor Jordan Poole, always bringing me energy. So exciting. There's a prayer group happening on aisle six. I love it. Um, <laughs> so he's talking about this old school way of, you know, when, when somebody's coming to you and they're saying, hey, man, I got a problem. You know, things are happening in my life. I'm not. That, that thing where you would, you know, lay hands and be like, look, bro, we're going to pray right now. I'm going to pray for you right now. Is that something that we should be going back to? You know, it's kind of this really interactive, hands-on approach to faith. I mean, not to be disrespectful, but it's bad that we literally have to go back to it. Uh. Because like all in the Bible, it, laying, off, laying on of hands is what we do. Um, we had a testimony of a lady who came and gave her testimony, uh, well, told her story of how she had cancer. We literally prayed for her. She came back to the church because they said that she had stage four cancer, only a couple of months to live. We laid hands on her. The ministers of God, we laid hands on her. I prayed for her. And she came back to the church three months later and said that she was cancer free. I love it. Miracle love signs it. and wonders. He's still a God of miracle signs and wonders. No it. matter if we got ripped jeans on or robes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, same God. Yes. Different method. Uh, same God, different method, but same principle. So yes. we can't lose it. We can't lose the power. Yeah, and I, and I think it might be almost like a societal thing. And this is like society letting, you know, we're, we're letting society impact the way our faith works. Yeah. You know, we. We want to be so respectful of somebody's personal space and, and you know, you don't want to, you know, if it's okay, can I touch this person? Right. Am I allowed to? But, you know, there, there's a big difference between a uncomfortable touch right. and a welcomed <laughs> one, you know. Right. So, so, yeah, I think the advice would be to, like, let's, let, let's try to get back there. Let's, let's go back to that, right? Right. right. I mean, we're in the Me Too movement, yeah. Me Too time, right? Yeah. But our testimony is that I've been healed because somebody prayed for me. Me Too, I've been delivered. Right. Me Too, I've been set yeah. free. So uh, uh, we have to just get back to the, the, the principles and the power of God. Because, right. you know, if we, don't, if we lose his power... It, what is the church without its power? Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. See, you heard it from Pastor Alex. We also heard it from Pastor Jordan Poole. This energy, this thing that we have is transferable. So don't be afraid to pass it along. We're going to go ahead and take another break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, home of the next generation pastors. We were just checking out Pastor Jordan Poole, but right now I want to go ahead and get back to Pastor Aaron and let him wrap up his sermon. Let's go ahead. 
So it comes back to that dynamic that a person plus restraint equals freedom. And the God-given role of parents is to impose this restraint or structure in order to help them become people who can live a life of freedom. Now, I need to make a few comments about discipline so that we're on the same page because I know this is easy to misunderstand. First, these verses and the Bible do not at all condone child abuse. Okay, especially as modern readers, we hear anything about rods and children and our minds immediately go to a parent reacting out of anger and abusing their child for no reason and inflicting harm upon their kids. That is not at all what the Bible is talking about. We need to be very clear about that. In no way would the Bible recommend any form of parental discipline out of anger for the purpose of abusing a child. That is always, always wrong. Hard stop. However, The Bible does consistently and strongly recommend forms of discipline that give memorable consequences in order to encourage a change in a child's behavior. Now look, every kid, every situation is different, and honestly, I'm not even really going to go into methods of discipline today because of just our normal time constraints and how complicated that topic is, but we're going to put out some great resources on that this week in the equip email. Use that box on the bottom of your connections card where we can sign you up for that email, and we'll get you some resources to think that topic through. But suffice it to say, if you're a parent who isn't helping your child to see the folly of their own behavior through meaningful consequences, the Bible says... You hate them. I know that my wife Lauren and I have used just about every discipline method in the book with our two short years that we've had Grayson to work on this principle. Um, And it's just a difficult thing to work through. But another thing we have to recognize with discipline is that corrective discipline is not the only kind of discipline that exists. When the Bible is referencing, it doesn't just mean consequences for bad behavior. I think we could impose other types of discipline in the life of our kids in order to Help them achieve the goal of developing a habit of wisdom and discernment and good habits. This doesn't just come from being told, no, get your hand out of the cookie jar. As parents, it also comes as we help establish good, you know, nutritional meals at dinner, not just saying no to the cookie when they've already had 10, right? Parents have a vital role in providing structure and discipline, not just consequences, Parents are the primary means that the restraint that we all eventually need enters into the life of a child, and the Bible is super clear on that. But what's the goal? Like as a parent, uh, what what am I trying to do? Are we just going to discipline our kids so that for the rest of our lives we have to hover over them watching their every single move? I sure hope not, because that sounds exhausting and terrible. (laughs) But the goal, that's not the goal of discipline, thankfully. The goal of discipline is actually self-discipline. As we're disciplining our kids, the goal is self-discipline. The goal of correcting them is self-correction. I mean, here's what Proverbs says in Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, start children off on the way they should go, and then even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Again, principle, not a promise. It's not a guarantee, but we get the idea. As we impose discipline and restraint on a child over time, the goal is that they, we, we would no longer have to impose certain rules or structures because the child will become responsible for their own behavior. Uh, like with a toddler, it's important. It's very important that you show them not to touch a hot stove, right? You go over and over and over the importance of this, but somewhere along the line, they will, it seems to me, inevitably touch the hot stove, and then there will be this meltdown, and everyone's crying, and mom and dad feel horrible, and the kid is screaming. It's just like this total disaster. But you continue to impose the rule. Don't touch the hot stove, and and now they've maybe learned a little bit. But if your teenager touches the hot stove, you don't feel bad for them, (laughs) right? You're way past the threshold of self-discipline at that point. You probably haven't reminded them of that rule in like a decade. So when your 16-year-old touches the hot stove, it's like, that's on you, bro. (laughs) But that's because if we go back to the chart from earlier, when we're thinking about this, a person plus restraint equals freedom. So for a child, that means discipline is what equals freedom. But what do we do when this is no longer a child? This is an adult. What's, what's our goal here? Well, we're, not, we're looking for restraint, but we aren't looking to do the discipline. What we're hoping for is self-discipline, right? That's what we're looking for, that in this formula, that eventually this child would become an adult and restraint would enter their life in the form of self-discipline. And to be honest, that's kind of the definition of being an adult in the first place, is having self-discipline, 
As a parent, what we're striving for is that the influencing hand of, decision, of, of discipline would eventually be replaced by the hand of self-discipline and self-correction. So rather than telling them to brush their teeth at night, they just do it on their own. Rather than having to force them to be home by 11 p.m., they just come home because they have to be in bed for work tomorrow. Rather than demanding church attendance from your middle schooler, eventually they're demanding church attendance from their middle schooler and acting like it was their idea in the first place. Nobody, nobody is running the race of parenting hoping to stay in complete control of their children's lives for their whole lives. We're all kind of hoping that sometime we get to a place where they're able to make the right call on their own. We're hoping that they become self-disciplined as a result of the imposed discipline of their childhood. And by the way, if you're a kid here today, meaning if at all you live under the rule of your parents' um, authority right now, you might be surprised to find out that self-discipline is all they're hoping for, right? Uh, you, 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 that you would just do this stuff on your own. So if you want to know, seriously, how to get your parents off of your back and have them stop nagging you about all this stuff, let me give you a pro tip right now, okay? Lean in, high schoolers. Clean your room before they ask, and they will never ask again. Huh? Yeah? Seriously. Come home before curfew. They will never give you another curfew fight again. Seriously. It just won't happen anymore. Uh, you will amaze. If you choose the right thing on your own, it's incredible how quickly your parents become reasonable. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. Check it out. And if you're in that adulting phase where it's not really clear if you're an adult yet, like maybe you're in college or just a little bit past college or whatever, and you're still like in and around with your parents, and it's not clear, like, am I an adult? Am I a kid? Like, I'm not really sure. Um, if you, let me just say, it's probably a good time to take a self-inventory of your level of self-discipline at this phase of your life. There's Pastor Aaron, you know, making some really good points about discipline. So I want to ask Pastor Alex, you know, are there... What could be the possible outcome of, you know, a lack of pro proper discipline in, in a kid's life? Well, when a kid doesn't receive that discipline from their parents, it manifests in adulthood. Okay. So, like, like, take the story of David, right? So his father neglected him, kept him in the field, didn't embrace him. Mm. And so that caused a spirit of rejection to develop in his life. And as he grew older, like, that rejection manifests into lust, and he, he had no self-control. Yeah. And so because he wasn't disciplined as a child, as an adult, and as a king who had power, who had authority, he had no limitations as well. Okay, see, I love that connection. I've never heard of, of that kind of connection going into, because everybody knows David had a really... You know, he, he had a spotty, right. not being nice, yeah. he had a real spotty past. Yeah. So that could absolutely be from the rejection from his father. And I never thought of it like that. And that's, that's a really cool connection that you made. Right. So obviously it's important. It's very important to have a parent there that's not only loving, but, but disciplined as well. Exactly. I mean, discipline translates into love. Okay. And, and attention. And like I said, that structure is so vital. We, we operate in structural, structures and everything in life. But we seem, I think parents just feel like they can't do the same thing. But we learn, we grow, we're nurtured through structure. Absolutely. So it's vital. Yeah, and I think people tend to look at structure as a, almost like a rigid, mean thing sometimes. But it's not. I mean, you know, structure. I had a, a, an old boss once tell me, you know, I would get so angry because he would always put these boundaries around what I can and what I couldn't do. And this was with art. And, and he would always tell me, there's freedom in the boundaries. And I'm like, no, there's not. No, there's no freedom in the boundaries. I want to do what I want to do. And it wasn't until one day where I realized how true what he was saying was, is that there is absolutely freedom within your boundaries and within your rules. And we have to pay attention to a rule right now and take another yeah. commercial break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. In October, we'll do our first conference in Athens. Still trying to figure out how we're gonna raise the money. We've gotten some incredible people to say yes and to come along in the journey with us. And as we move, God is just continuing to open door after door after door. And so I'm not afraid anymore of how it's gonna turn out. I'm not afraid of where the money's gonna come from. I know he's going to provide a way because here's what I've realized in my life is that if I say yes to the direction that God is calling me into, it always leads to more. So I've decided that I'm gonna be the kind of person who opens my hands, trusts God's with my plans, and I am going to follow Jesus wherever he asks me to go. 
there you have it. Now, like we do at the end of every episode of Ambo TV, I like to ask our guest pastor to give us a scripture that myself and the folks at home can uh, read that kind of goes to what pastor was just talking about, which is trusting in God. So do you have a scripture that, you know, we can take away with this? Yeah, definitely. This scripture I live by, Philippians 1 and 6 says, being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun a good work in you shall perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. And I came to say that if he called you to it, he'll grace you to finish. All right. I love it. Pastor Alex, thank you so much oh, for yes, being sir. here today. I really enjoyed having you. Please come back again soon. Come on. Uh, you know I'm going to be back. All right. That's your word? Yes, sir. That's I'm your there. word. All right. I got you. Uh, and to our partnering churches, Mountain Lake Church with Pastor Gerald, Northridge Church with Pastor Aaron, and Hope Church with Pastor Jordan. Thanks for those powerful messages. Please keep them coming. And to see the complete sermons and other great sermons, head over to ambotv.com. We always have great content for you there. And uh, you can sign up for our new newsletter. How awesome is that? Remember, join us every Monday and Thursday at 11 p.m. on TLN. This has been Ambo TV. God bless.